Investing in gold doesn't have to be complicated. I'm Colin Plume, the CEO of Noble Gold Investments, and I want to take the time to show you how investing in a gold IRA can help you hedge your bets against inflation and other economic concerns on the horizon. Visit Noble Gold Investments and get our free gold investment guide on buying gold the right way. And make sure you're investing with the right company. Visit noblegoldinvestments.com. Good morning. I'm still reporting on the coup. Bill Barr dared to show his fatherly face on Fox in Tuesday's coverage of Trump's arraignment by Manhattan District Attorney Alvin Bragg. In the post-election 2020 period, I incorrectly believed that Barr would support Trump as well as several Pennsylvania state legislators who demanded a federal investigation into claims of voter fraud in that state. But Barr refused to back the investigation. In my opinion, this in effect allowed the forces of evil to swallow and devour the rule of law in the United States. Barr had a calling, a duty to protect the rule of law, not only in the U.S., but in the words of British politician Nigel Farage, for the destiny of all Western civilization. According to Trump, Bill Barr feared his own impeachment more than standing up for America against what has now been revealed, in my opinion, to be an effort headed by a group of extreme leftists to hand this nation over to Chinese control. However, Bill Barr, as of Tuesday, seems to be softening his criticism of Trump. Why? Perhaps he now sees the devastating consequences of allowing Soros money and Chinese influence to take over the American judicial system. During Tuesday's coverage of the indictment of President Trump in Manhattan court, Barr was the star Fox commentator. I found his take on the situation surprising. Prosecution should always involve a measure of discretionary judgment where you weigh the public interest as a whole. And uh, even before I became attorney general the second time, I said in relation to uh, Mueller's investigation uh, that before we go off uh, on, a, on a president, a sitting president or a former president, there should be clear evidence of a real crime. It shouldn't, shouldn't be a debatable crime. The evidence should be strong. And also, this is not just by virtue of his pr pr prior office, but he's a candidate in the current election. So this is a, a charging decision that affects our current national politics. And judgment there, it seems to me, and prosecutorial discretion should, should uh, commend caution in this circumstance. And as I've said, this appears to be just a pathetically weak case that is, I think, demonstrably long, wrong on the law, which explains why the Department of Justice uh, uh, even after I left office, has never pursued this idea of uh, uh, campaign finance problem. It was passed on by the Southern District of New York, passed yeah. on by the Federal Election Commission, this <clears> case. <throat> so, you know, you talk about prosecutorial discretion. Uh, it, it looks like the next level, uh, the next opportunity for that discretion is going to fall on this judge, Marchand, uh, when he looks at whether or not to dismiss this case if he feels that it is, in your words, pathetically weak. What goes into that part of this process, Bill? Well, I think it'll be largely a legal judgment as to whether there, whether the, uh, there's really probable cause to believe that this uh, falsification of records was done to defraud anybody. Uh, and second, whether or not this is, uh, involves the campaign finance law, which I, I don't think it does. Uh, and I think any idea that this defrauds the voters, as Andy just said a moment ago, is simply, full, is, is simply wrong. You know, that doesn't create a crime. But it, so if that's the case, and your Judge Marchand, who has successfully prosecuted another financial uh, case in the Trump, with the Trump Organization, and you look at this, you know, how do you, how do you weigh that? Do you expect that because he's in this courtroom, he's just going to say, you know, no, we're not going to dismiss this charge. It's been brought by... D.A. Bragg? No, I mean, I, I mean, hope, I hope he exercises his role as a judge and serves as a screening mechanism f for, you know, this kind of uh, overreach by a prosecutor. I, I'm not optimistic he will, but we'll see.
So the other issues that we expect to be brought up here are change of venue. Uh, Jonathan Turley said, although that is usually something that is not taken, not, you know, uh, not acted upon, uh, he said there might be an argument for that here. What do you think? Yeah, I thought that that was one of the stronger arguments. Uh, I agree with Jonathan on that. But again, I'm not holding my breath that there's going to be any change in that. We also have talked about the larger scope of some of these other um, processes that are underway. And the one that you have said is looks the most problematic for the former president is the Mar-a-Lago classified document case that's under Jack Smith, the special counsel right now. Um, talk to us a little bit about your thinking on that one. Well, I, I, you know, I think uh, the issue there isn't the taking of the documents. Uh, I think the issue there is what happened after the department asked for them back, which they are government property, and also then subpoenaed them. And I've, I, from the government's actions, I believe that they probably have evidence of uh, efforts to mislead the government, and they're trying to determine whether Trump was behind that and was involved in obstructing their uh, efforts to obtain the documents. And that would be viewed as a fairly serious problem. But again, discretion would come into play uh, there as well. And uh, I think Trump did not hurt himself initially by his bombastic statements about, and his you know, truculence about the documents and uh, making some what were perceived as threats about public, you know, uh, uh, uproar if the government was to pursue him. But on the other hand, since, since that, you've had Biden and Pence involved with document problems. So that would cut against, that would cut in favor of exercising discretion because otherwise you would have the appearance of, uh, you know, two systems of justice and two different standards. Barr is then asked whether he thinks the judge will put a gag order on President Trump. His answer is very interesting. He does. I mean, I think it's important for him to get his message out. And uh, I think it would be very bad to impose a gag order on, on him, uh, especially in the circumstances of this case where he's a candidate in an election. Barr then predicts that at some point an honest judge will throw this case out and it will never be tried before a jury. Well. I was in the middle of saying why this lawyer from Cadwallader would take the case. Yes. And the other reason why, one reason he would take it is because at the end of the day, it's going to be a winner. Uh, and at some point, someone will, uh, with, with, uh, who isn't infected by the craziness of our age is going to come in and straighten this thing out at some level of the judiciary, even if it goes into the federal appellate system. And since it all turns on a federal criminal statute, I think it would ultimately come to that. So at some point, some judge is going to stand up and do what's right here. I hope it's the first judge. Barr is then asked to speculate why this DA would stick his neck out this far and put forward such a weak case. Uh, I, I don't know. I don't know why he would do it. But obviously, we've been saying all along that politics has had a lot to do with this. He campaigned on going after Trump. And uh, maybe he views himself as delivering on that promise. Barr is then asked what effect these purported investigations by locally elected district attorneys will have on the powers of the president. It'll have a tremendous chilling effect on robust conversations and give and take uh, debates within the executive branch, and that'll lead to worse government. Fox host Martha McCallum then asked Barr what the penalty would be if the DA Bragg indictment went to trial and then won a conviction. In, in the worst case scenario, Bill, let's say that they can prove that that happened. What's the punishment? I, I think for a felony, uh, this felony, it's up to five years, I think, in New York. And is there a history of people serving five years for this kind of violation? I doubt it. I think probably... Uh, they wouldn't they get a suspended sentence. And if it's a person who's never had in any crime uh, on their record before, does that? Especially if there's no, especially if there's no victims, if there are no, def, you know, defrauded victims, it's hard to see what the basis would be for, uh, you know, sentencing someone to time in prison. After all, this is a DA who doesn't like putting people in prison. No, he currently. doesn't. Uh, I'm still reporting from just outside the Citadel of World Freedom. Good day.